Now, COP27 uh, and the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Gutierrez, have been damning. They've said, we are on a highway to climate hell with our foot on the accelerator. So where do we go from here? There are many answers to that question. And today we're going to focus our discussion on a slightly more controversial topic called solar climate intervention. If you've just joined us, welcome. I am Nelifa Hidayat. This is Doha Debates on Twitter Spaces. It's fantastic to have you here with us in this regular space that we create where we have compelling, important discourse and debate without any of the other stuff. There's not going to be any major winners and losers here. All we're going to try and do is create a space for different perspectives to create, to increase our understanding. Now, as it is COP27 and the United Nations uh, uh, Secretary General, Antonio Gutierrez, has said we are on a highway to climate hell with our foot on the accelerator. The question is, where do we go from here? What is the solution? In a moment, I'm going to be joined by two scientists and academics who believe that there is a, a debate that needs to be had around a more controversial topic called solar climate intervention, which is also known as solar geoengineering. Now, to help us better understand these issues, um, I want to go to them. The key thing here for me, uh, Sir David and Jenny, is to allow the both of you enough space to have this conversation together. I'm going to try and stay out of this as much as I can. So without any further ado, I am joined by Jenny C. Stevens, the Dean's Professor of Sustainability Science and Policy at Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts. Her recent research focuses specifically on geoengineering and who is promoting it and developing it. On the other side of this debate is Sir David King, the founder and chair of the Centre for Climate Repair at Cambridge University. From 2000 to 2007, Sir David was the UK government's chief scientific advisor. Welcome to you both. Now, in the next 45 minutes, I'm going to be hearing from the both of you. But, but to begin, I want to set out the position for, for both of you. As I mentioned, we're talking about the Secretary General for the UN saying that we're on a, quote, highway to climate hell. I mean, that seems hyperbolic, but I don't think I don't think he's far from from the mark. Jenny, to you first, should we be considering, should we be researching and considering uh, uh, this geoengineering method? And in layperson's term as well, what exactly is climate intervention actually? Jenny first, please go on. Okay, well, thank you. It's great to be here. Um, I am very concerned about the advancing and mainstreaming of solar geoengineering as an approach, which refers to efforts to uh, modify the incoming solar radiation um, by blocking some of the sun coming into the Earth's um, system. And I think it's extremely dangerous uh, to be exploring and mainstreaming these ideas for two reasons. First of all, there's no way to do this in a fair, equitable, and just democratic way. Advancing solar geoengineering creates just one more mechanism for wealthy, powerful people, countries, organizations to control and manipulate the world for their benefit while further disadvantaging those who are most vulnerable. So from a climate justice perspective, mm -hmm. climate justice focuses our attention on who has power and control and who, how the suffering is, is distributed. Um, this mechanism is, is, is very dangerous. And the second thing is that it also is speculative, imaginary, technologically, um, optimistic and it creates yet one more mechanism to justify delay from the deeper transformative structural systemic changes that are so desperately needed. So that's why I um, don't think it's a good idea to be advancing this idea. Jenny St. Stevens, thank you for setting that out. I hear you. It's time to move on to Sir David King. Sir David, what is your perspective and also your definition of what climate intervention actually is?
Uh, I'm just going to wait uh, for Sir David, hopefully, to unmute his mic by pressing the little purple mic, I believe, on the bottom left hand part. I, Sir I, David. I think I've got it now. Right. <laughs> Please go so, on. So, so basically, the business I'm in is the following. Uh, the world is now, today, in a very, very dangerous situation. I don't believe that if we do not follow some sort of climate repair process, that there is a future for humanity. Even if we were to hit net zero emissions tomorrow, mm. there is already too much in the way of greenhouse gases up there. And the reason I say that is, please look at what's happening in the Arctic Circle region. The rest of the planet has now warmed up by 1.35 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level, and everyone acknowledges that 1.5 is a, is a level we should try to stay below, if at all possible. 1.35 is pretty close to that figure. But what about the Arctic Circle, where the temperature is now 3 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level? And we all know about tipping points, or those of us who are working in climate science know about tipping points. There are about 15 potential tipping points around the world which will dramatically change the weather systems. And the first of these are in the Arctic Circle region. And these tipping points are scheduled to go anywhere between one and a half and two and a half degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level. Now, we know that today the Arctic Circle region tipping points have tipped, which means the, the ice on Greenland is now melting irreversibly. It also means that the release of methane from permafrost in the land around the North Pole, around the Arctic Sea, the release of permafrost from those regions is now happening explosively with the release of methane into the atmosphere. Now, what I'm saying is we're currently at over 500 parts per million of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, not 420, that's just carbon dioxide. Methane is now rising rapidly. And the pre-industrial level was 275. We've gone too far. We have to bring greenhouse gases down mm. to something like 350 parts per million or less. And at the same time, we will have to create time to do this by learning how to refreeze the Arctic. And so my program is not to use sulfates into the stratosphere, properly described as geoengineering. It's rather to put white cloud cover over the Arctic Circle for the three months of this polar summer. So that is that is a great uh, sort of encapsulation of where you stand, Sir David, and uh, Ginny as well for you. I, I, I want to start off from a place of levelled understanding. So we're going to take a breath. We're going to take a moment and we're going to try and summarize each other's arguments so that I know that we are all on the same page, because this is a really critical conversation uh, with key difficult terms to understand. So, Jenny, if I may come to you first, please, could you summarize Sir David's argument as accurately as you can in about a sentence or two? What is Sir David trying to say here about climate intervention? Yeah, so I think um, he is saying that because the climate crisis is so bad, we need to um, explore all options. And as a scientist, he is mostly concerned about the devastating consequences in the Arctic. Oh, fantastic. So, so David, if, if you might unmute, unmute yourself, do you agree with that interpretation of what, what Jenny has just said of your argument? Yes, Perfect. Then, then I might come to you, Sir David. What do you think Jenny is saying uh, in earnest? And, and if you could just sum that up, her argument up in, in a sentence or two. What Jenny is saying is very, very clear. Uh, she would like to work in, in a world which is equitable, uh, fair, democratic, where the wealthy don't have the supreme power over the poor, etc. And by the way, I totally agree with that. Mm. And at the, at the same time, she is saying that the uh, mainstreaming of geoengineering in the form of blocking the sun is speculative, imaginary technology, and so on. And mm. as a matter of fact, in terms of putting sulfates into the stratosphere, I think Jenny's quite right. <laughs> Jenny, is that a fair assessment of what you are saying, trying to get across to our listeners? 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Well, we've done our bit uh, to try and make this um, an even starting point. For those of you who have just joined us, I apologize for the technical issues at the start of this Doha debates on Twitter spaces. We're trying to have a conversation about climate change, specifically thinking about the risks and the rewards or the opportunity that climate intervention ideas like solar geoengineering provide. Uh, if you have any questions or any thoughts on what our guests have said so far, please tweet us at Doha Debates. It's time to get stuck in. So time to get to, to, to the questions and get some of our listeners uh, on air to, to be able to have their say. We're, we've already heard a bit about climate justice and that idea that Jenny mentioned of the most vulnerable people in the world uh, picking up the tab, taking the hit, suffering immensely uh, and being exploited uh, 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 in an unequal way when it comes to the climate crisis. So I want to turn to uh, Mariam Kilani first to see if I can get a question from Mariam with regards to this idea. Uh, Mariam is part of our Doha Debates Ambassador Programme, which is a first of its kind initiative for young change makers from all over the world uh, to, to find each other, to get together and to, to get involved in things. You can find out more about that at Doha Debates. But Mariam, what is your question to our guests, please? Hello, hello, Nalufa. Thank you for giving me this opportunity and really thank you for hosting this space on a very important topic. Um, I think uh, my question is very similar to what Jenny, in fact, uh, started off the conversation about. And um, I want to ask Sir David about um, that same idea. So essentially, my question is about how um, my country, Pakistan, it contributes less than 1% to the global carbon footprint, but it is one of the top 10 countries most affected by climate change. And this year's flooding alone um, affected more than 33 million people. It has led to food insecurity, waterborne diseases, and so many other problems. And so my concern with climate change solutions, including climate intervention, which is um, which includes um, the topic that we're discussing today, is about the question of inclusivity and equity. And I really want to understand who is going to run this project of, social, uh, of solar geoengineering and mm -hmm. who benefits, benefits from it. And how can I trust that solar geoengineering will not just be another project that is undertaken by the global north um, that has more side effects for the global south than they have for the global north? Um, that's my question. Thank you. So, David, you first, please. Thank you very much for your very good question, Marianne. I'm very familiar with what's happening in Pakistan and the floods you've had uh, and are still having today are totally destructive. And as you say, Pakistan is a very, very small emitter of carbon dioxide. It is the wealthy countries of the world that are responsible for this. I'm going to say to you that I have formed a climate crisis advisory group and that advisory group composed of 16 experts from 12 different countries includes, for example, a representative of the Sami and Inuit people who live on the permafrost in the Arctic Circle region. We are trying to be totally inclusive with this group of 16 people. And so far, we have put out 10 reports, and there'll be four more reports coming out during COP27. And these reports are all dealing with a situation where the developing world is suffering much worse than the developed world. And so we're not pulling our punches. We're saying the developed world has not delivered. If, if I say to you that most of the emissions, of course, are still coming from the old developed Western world. And if we therefore need to look for a way forward, we can only do this if the developed world reduces its emissions deeply and rapidly and also contributes financially to the developing world to manage not only the transition to low carbon futures and not only to dealing with the impacts of climate change, but also dealing with the uh, business of recovering from loss and damage that has already occurred, such as is happening in Pakistan now. So I, I, I just want you to know that I'm totally with you on this. And to be honest, I think the, the indigenous people of the world are the people we should be turning to for help because it's the indigenous people who understand that 
managing their ecosystems, which they've done for thousands of years, managing their ecosystems is also managing their well-being. And then we came along, I'm, I'm afraid the we I'm referring to is the West and its free market system. We came along and put no value on the ecosystems. Mm. We're just dumping everything into the ocean, etc. Now, of course, I wish to hell we weren't where we are now, but we are where we are now. What do we do about it? We do have to take the world with us in any, any of the solutions that we uh, wish to follow through. If we don't do that, we know that there will be a massive series of complaints and this will lead to a blocking of any possible way forward. So I think you need to understand that those of us who are in this business are really caring about managing the future for humanity. But managing for the future for humanity means also managing the ecosystems of the world. Jenny, you can come right in here. I, 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 I bet you're biting at the chops. Please do come in. Yes. Yeah, so um, I would just raise um, the challenge we have here of the complexity of the Earth's systems and trying to intentionally manipulate and control the Earth's systems in one region of the world um, will have inevitably adverse impacts in other parts of the world. So, um, and I think the uncertainty and um, the, the dangers associated with trying to um, develop or advance any of these ideas um, are really uh, a result of a very narrow way of thinking, which I sometimes call climate isolationism, which is thinking about, oh, the climate change is the problem. We have to fix that and we need a technical fix for it where climate change a lot of us climate justice uh people are thinking about social change social structures social innovations not technological innovations we are very aware that um the climate crisis is a symptom of a larger problem and we need to fix the larger problem and that is our social and political and economic systems that mm. are perpetuating concentrating wealth and power and allowing the corporate corporate control of what's happening in the world we know the science we've known it for decades yet fossil fuels and all the fossil fuel companies are still planning to continue to explore and exploit and um, their fossil fuel resources. So that's what we have to stop. I wish all the solar geoengineering advocates uh, put their energy on resisting fossil fuel influence in our politics and our economy um, instead. Uh, I think that would be a much more uh, productive approach. I, I have to bring in Sir David at this point. Are we opening Pandora's box? You know, by accepting the 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 bad with the good, are we suggesting then that that just dealing with the symptoms of this issue by by uh, making the the clouds whiter, by releasing sulfur into the air, by painting roofs white, whatever this engineering might be, are we just dealing with the symptoms, Sir David? So <laughs> that's a very, very important question. And I'm going to answer you by saying, please, let's differentiate between putting sulfates into the stratosphere, because that is, I think, what uh, is being referred to by Jenny when she says you, you try to impact on one region of the world and you impact on the whole world. If we put sulfates into the stratosphere, we could possibly cool the Arctic region and uh, keep the ice covering the Arctic Sea, but we could also turn off the uh, monsoon in India, in the Indian subcontinent. That would be disastrous, quite obviously. And the reason is because putting sulfates into the stratosphere is a virtually uncontrollable process. This is why we are trying to do what <clears throat> we believe is quite simply biomimicry. We're we're learning how to create white cl cloud cover in the same way that the oceans create white cloud cover. Very normal process. When there are storms at sea, tiny droplets of water are pulled up into the up upper atmosphere by the, the warm air over the, the warm sea when the sun is shining. And as those droplets evaporate their water, you're left with a tiny crystal of salt and as that comes down, it collects water vapor again, and bingo, you've got a white cloud 
if the droplets are small enough. If it's a black cloud, that means the droplets were too big. Now, what this process means is you only create white cloud cover when you know the direction of wind travel is going to take your white clouds where you want the cooling to happen. And if there's any deleterious effect, you simply stop making the white clouds. And within two weeks, there'd be no further impact whatsoever. So we, we really have to make sure that we listen carefully to what many of us are doing. Many of us are taking the position I am. No, we should have a moratorium against putting sulfates into the stratosphere. I'm not saying that moratorium should be on experiments. Experiments need to be conducted because let us suppose that in the Indian subcontinent, and this is not far-fetched, not many years from now, we may have such a big heat wave that perhaps a million people die of heat stress because they have no access to air conditioning. Now, in that situation, perhaps the Indian government would try to put up sulfates into the stratosphere. But if there are no experiments that are being conducted to check what the negative impacts would be, then we're in a deep lot of trouble. So don't stop experiments, but do stop anything at scale until it's been tried and tested. Jenny, um, I, I want to give you the opportunity first and then to Sir David. This is something I know you believe in deeply uh, and passionately, so I, I want to allow you the opportunity, but I, perhaps this might be an important moment in the Still Hard Debates Twitter spaces on climate change and geoengineering to, to allow our two guests to ask questions of each other. So, Jenny, I, I want to hand that over to you. If there's something that you want to ask uh, Sir David, perhaps about this idea of research, that might be interesting. Um, I think, well, one question I have is about um, the the governance question, I guess. Like, how would, how would this... Um, um, be governed in and how who would control I think it's a similar question to what the first um, guest also asked um, and then also about how um, if if this was to go forward are you advocating that we start this immediately um, or when would it be bad enough um, that you think um, these kinds of interventions and manipulations should start? So, so David, please do come in uh, if you'd like to, to those questions from Jenny. Yeah. So very good questions again, Jenny. So let, let me say the governance question. Uh, that we do have, for example, a law of the seas uh, we do have a London Protocol protecting the oceans from dumping at sea and so on, and the experiments that uh, that are being conducted in the oceans, and I am involved in that, are very, very carefully conducted so that they meet London Protocol standards and no, no dumping occurs in the process. Now, equally, we need uh, a, a law that covers the uh, use of the stratosphere, and as I've said, I would like to see uh, the United Nations putting a moratorium on doing such a thing, and the United Nations is the proper body to do this. Uh, we do need a proper examination of the entire legal position, and that legal position means looking at the interests of everyone, not dominating the interests through the interests of the very wealthy or, in particular, the business community. I, I agree very much with the comments that were made about the, the fossil fuel uh, wealth and the enormous lobby that they control, particularly in the United States, but it's impacted on other parts of the world as well. The reason we're in this very difficult position now, I would argue, and I've been involved in the negotiations very directly, for the last 20 plus years, I would argue is because of the fossil fuel lobby in the United States hob hobbling the US from taking proper action. We haven't had leadership from the US in the COP process yet. So we, we've we overstepped the mark. And I come to your second question. When do we need to do this? Well, I'm afraid when it was at 2015 in Paris, when I was running the negotiations from the British end, and we were a very important part of that, leading on the 1.5 degrees, 
I was arguing against any intervention of the kind we're now discussing. It's too late now. And so I think if we can learn quickly, and I mean in the next three to four years, how we can safely refreeze the Arctic, by which I mean keeping the ice cover that is formed during the previous Arctic winter when the sun has gone down to the South Pole, keeping it there throughout the three summer months of the polar north, then we can slowly grow back that ice cover to protect ourselves from the very high temperatures in that region. And this is crucial. Otherwise, we're going to get sea level rises of seven meters. And that, that is the end of civilization. Temperature rises, five to eight degrees centigrade is possible if enough methane is emitted from the permafrost regions. So I think all of this is now a matter of great urgency. But when I say all of this, I have to say deep and rapid emissions reduction is the first and foremost thing we have to do. But we need to buy time and we need to buy time rapidly by refreezing the Arctic. The extreme weather events we've observed around the world over the last three years have probably cost us in loss and damage terms about half a trillion dollars. And when I say cost us, I'm talking about every country in the world, but the country's most hard hit are once again the poorest countries in the world. Well, I'd like to just follow up um, and say that in terms of the ideal of having an international governance structure is is nice in theory, but we 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 can see from evidence from what's been happening with our international governance that we don't have a um, international governance regime for coordination and, and cooperation um, for such deploying any of any of these in a way that that would be um, just and equitable. And I think you mentioned uh, the dominance of the United States, and I think the United States um, is a dangerous unilateral player here. Um, most of the research um, in solar geoengineering is um, in the United States. A lot of it is funded by Bill Gates and other tech billionaire and financial billion finance billionaires who are very technology focused. And, th and whenever they think of world problems, they think of technologies that can fix them. And they are not um, Many of them are really not thinking about social change, social justice, innovations in our social and economic systems that could um, um, alleviate the suffering that we are experiencing already. And I, I think I would just say that there really is a risk as we, um, as some proponents are advocating for more research, more investment into these kinds of technological um, approaches, there's, there's really a risk, a big risk of a single non-state actor potentially doing, the, doing these. Apparently, it, technologically, you know, it's, it's not that hard to do. Um, and, um, you know, I think there, there is possibility of people like Elon Musk or um, other uh, billionaires deciding that they want to do have an influence on the world in a new, different way, um, all in the you know leveraging the climate crisis as as justification as a public good, when really there's um, deep um, problematic power dynamics uh, involved here. So I so I just want to emphasize the re the importance of recognizing who is advancing these kinds of ideas and how they're being funded and for whose interests are really um, at, at, at the forefront and being prioritized. I agree with almost everything you've said there. First of all, the United States is leading the way in developing new technologies through extremely wealthy people. And you mentioned the name of one of them, uh, but there are many others who believe that there are technological fixes. And by technological fixes, I think they're also referring to, oh, we can keep driving our cars, we can keep burning oil, coal and gas. Uh, we can do it all because we'll find a technological fix. Now, I'm saying to you, we're in a very severe problem. At 500 parts per million plus in the atmosphere today, there is no manageable future for humanity. So 
we have to find other ways to manage this. And the ways in which those of us in Europe and in many other parts of the world, and we are working with people in the South, with people in India, with people in China, there, there are many, many people around the world who are engaged in the kind of program I am, which is focusing on biomimicry. How do we imitate what nature does and do it in a way that is not at all harmful to the planet? But we also always emphasize deep and rapid emissions reduction is a sine qua non in the sense that if we keep emitting at 40 billion tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere every year, which is where we are today, then frankly, we're cooked. There's nothing we can do about it. None of these fixes would work. So we, we really have a major problem on our hands. And so first and foremost, we need the COP process to deliver. And if it doesn't, we need willing nations to deliver what is needed to be done. And I think that's a, it's a very big challenge. I'm fully aware of it. I've been in those negotiations for far too many years, too many scars on my back, not to be able to say this is bloody awful. And I think... I want to just go back to what I was saying about the indigenous people, the people who've been treated so badly in the last three or 400 years by the Western colonialists, whether it is in the United States, the people called the Red Indian people, or whether it's in Australia with the Aboriginal people, wherever the Aboriginals or the other local people who've lived there for hundreds, if not thousands of years, uh, finding themselves being regarded as subhuman and virtually wiped out. Those are the people who know how to manage the future. We, know, we need to learn from them. And I'm afraid that Elon Musk and company, that's the last thing on their minds. So I am going to agree with much of what uh, Jenny is saying. Well, I would just also note that indigenous leaders from around the world have written a letter to Harvard Solar Geoengineering Program asking them to stop the Scopex experiment. Um, and so there has been some coordination there. And I think dismissive of their uh, that resistance. So I'm not I'm not sure exactly what you, how you're interpreting uh, listening to indigenous people. At this point, uh, b b before we before we get down uh, to, too much into a narrow hole, I'd like to maybe offer you both some perspective of what our online audience makes of this conversation and this question to the points that you have raised on uh, issues to do with governance uh, and, and, and so on. So we asked our Twitter audience, uh, solar climate intervention, also known as solar geoengineering, refers to a controversial method of cooling the earth by reflecting the sun's rays back onto space, into space. We asked, do you think this technology should be used? Well, 20.8% of respondents said yes. 167 said no, no more. And a further... 62.5% said there does need to be more research. So the general consensus from those uh, folks who had responded to that on our polls online agreed that this needs to be something that we look further into. But to come back to this idea of, of painting a bigger, more important global picture, can, can you both of you perhaps talk a little bit about where different countries, where different nations are with this experimentation? Are there any people leading the way in a positive way or in a negative way as you see fit? Jenny, I'd like to bring your thoughts and your expertise as a scientist and an academic to answer that question. Is anyone getting it right? Who on, on this earth is, is doing geoengineering? Um, well, I mean, as we've talked about, there's multiple different definitions of what is geoengineering. Um, but I think the concern is that this really has been dominated by um, an elite group, a very small group of uh, privileged Western scientists. And, and then there's been efforts to try to 
um, gain global participation by providing funding. Um, some of these same uh, billionaire philanthropists philanthropies have been offering funding to scientists in all around the world, in the, including in the global south, to um, explore these same scientific technical um, questions. Um, and, and I think there has been um, kind of a, a lack of, of attention to the social and political dimensions of this and and the the risks associated with with that and that and I think that's what I'm um, trying to bring to to this conversation um, I think it's hard it's hard to be against something when um, obviously the situation is so bad and so dire and we've been ineffective for so long to effectively respond to the climate crisis so uh, I think uh, Sir David and I definitely agree that it's very unfortunate that we are where we are uh, here in 2022. Um, but I think um, these these kinds of uh, Earth system manipulations, um, there really is is not a a an example that that I, that I think know of, of of a positive um example here and i think we really should be listening to indigenous values and other kinds of knowledge beyond the scientific technical engineering details because i think that's dominated the conversation and there are so many other values and there's so many other aspects of our society that um, are also really important and and not about controlling and trying to manipulate the earth systems in this way. Um, so th so that's that's kind of how I would respond um, on that. Thank you. So David, uh, if I if I may bring you in at this point, is there any? We haven't spoken about China in this. I mean, we briefly mentioned the United States, largest the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases. Who is, who is pioneering the technology in a way that you agree with? And what is that effect on an uh, international scale in the international arena? Uh, just, uh, Sir David, just waiting for you perhaps to unmute your uh, mic. And yes, please, go on. I'm unmuted now. Uh, yes. the, the, the Climate Crisis Advisory Group, is putting out country reports. And we're in a very strong position to do this. Uh, and we've got a country report coming out on the United States, on China, on uh, Brazil, and, uh, uh, and on India uh, next week during the COP meeting. And the conclusion is that actually China has done a vast amount to develop the technologies required to replace the fossil fuel technologies. Uh, and as a matter of fact, they've contributed more to that development than almost any other part of the world. And so I, I think the finger pointing at China is all based around the following, that in China, and I don't use this as an excuse, but it needs to be acknowledged that about 800 million people have been pulled out of poverty into becoming a new middle class in China just this century of the last 22 years. And in that process, their emissions began to rise very rapidly. In about 2017, their emissions stopped rising, but their GDP growth is still increasing. So they have finally broken the connection between their rapid GDP growth and their emissions. And I think they need to be given credit for that. Now they need to turn this around and reduce emissions as quickly as possible. The Chinese are very focused on this. They're not focused on the other issues that we are discussing. But I think I, I just want to say this. We've got a very, very bleak future unless we can get the world to understand the nature of the threats we're, po uh, we're posed with today. If we all understood the, the extreme nature of these threats, I think we could all begin to sit around and discuss how we should manage this going forward in time. It would need an equitable approach. It would need people to recognize each of us is import as important as everyone else no matter what your wealth, no matter how poor. It is so critically important that we change the mood of the world and use this as the means of achieving perhaps something major in terms of a, of a good transition. What we cannot do 
is simply rely on technology. And mm. you're quite right to point to, for example, Elon Musk as a potential leader on this sort of thing, to rely on technology to pull us out of this without changing our economic system, which has been based on destruction of our ecosystems. Now, there's a, a key parameter. It's a very, very big ask to move away from that. And in the meantime, those of us who are working, if you like, at the coal face, we feel we've just got to go for it. Because if we have another 10 years of the Arctic Circle warming up, and it's still warming up at four times the rate of the rest of the planet, then everything I'm describing today in terms of extreme weather events, such as in Pakistan, these extreme weather events are going to get much more extreme, and we will see masses of people dying of heat stress, floods, lack of food, etc. I can see Alperin Kochsol is here. Uh, with us in this Doha Debates Twitter Spaces conversation about the climate crisis and geoengineering. Alpirin, if I may bring you in now, uh, you are part of the Doha Debates Ambassador Programme as well. Uh, welcome. Good to have you. What is your question and who is it to? Uh, well, actually, my question was about the technological risks that the uh, geoengineering has. Uh, I think the part a part of the question was answered already, but uh, I can still ask it in terms of like uh, I mean geoengineering is a new technology and it has a lot of risks. But I want to learn uh, if this problem can be solved uh, if this problem can be solved uh, with further research on in the coming decades. Also, uh, I specifically uh, want to ask to Jenny about the uh, further technological advances in geoengineering, uh, bringing more equality to the uh, power structure in the geoengineering sector. Because, I mean, if the technology progresses over time, the uh, accessibility also increases in theory. So, does Jenny think that uh, it, it is possible and we can mitigate those uh, inequality risks uh, in the global scale? So that is my uh, question. Thank you. Um, so my um, perspective is that there isn't a way, there's no more research that we can do that will help us. Um, uh, mitigate the in injustices, the, the risks of exacerbating inequities and disparities around the world and the real fundamental um, concerns about water systems, availability, agriculture, food systems. Um, and, and so I, I, and I think that's the, the challenge is that the, both the um, physical risks uh, faced of the uncertainty of manipulating the earth systems in these ways, um, coupled with the governance risks where we don't have adequate international governance systems that would enable this to be equitable, um, kind of make it, a, a, in my mind, a, a, just a dangerous approach um, to be advancing at all. Um, I, I, I embrace and, and encourage people to um, support the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. We have to start there. We should be stopping starting a phase down of fossil fuel supply and we haven't done that yet so like we are not doing everything that we could be doing um to mitigate um and the more we promote these uh other technological ideas and speculative um then we are um just promoting climate obstruction and continued delay of the systemic and structural changes that are absolutely essential so so that's where i um, you know, I, I endorse kind of a feminist perspective, a youth perspective, focusing on climate justice and the structural transformative changes. This is a non-transformative 
approach. It is uh, what some of us are calling a false solution. It, do it doesn't get at the root of the problem. So it is kind of waste of time and energy to focus on it as much as is being promoted. So um, I really encourage people to be thinking more structurally and systematically with transformative, a transformative lens. We need big changes um, and you know, trying to change the incoming solar radiation is not a big change. And it, it really runs the risk of slowing down and just delaying and distracting from the changes that we really need. So David King, uh, if you could unmute yourself and respond to, to Al Perrin and Jenny's remarks, if that's all right. Just need to unmute that first, please, Sir David. Um, hoping that Sir David can still hear me and be part of this conversation uh, for Doha Debates on Twitter Spaces. Sir David, if you can unmute your mic and tackle that question from Alperin uh, about the possibility of mitigating any of the uh, problems that Jenny foresees by hopefully uh, uh, solving it technically and technologically in the future. So David, if you are free and able to make those remarks, please do so. Just waiting for Sir David to hopefully unmute his mic. Otherwise, we'll go on to some of the audience's uh, tweets that we've had so far. Um, but before that, Alperin, if I might come to you, what do you make of Jenny's answer so far? Well, actually, uh, sorry. Mm. <clears throat> the, uh, actually, my thoughts are very similar to Jenny. I would say it is the same. I don't think the uh, more further technological change is required because we have already the methods to uh, make geoengineering real. But... Um, yeah, I mean, it is. In, I see mm. the possibility of uh, mitigating the risks uh, of geoengineering and also the social consequences. Uh, not that possible. So uh, I agree with Jenny here. Uh, okay. But I just wanted to get uh, her and Sir David's perspective on it because I also think that the uh, if. Uh, so we were talking about the uh, global wealthy countries uh, in the West uh, being a monopoly in this technology. And I also want to, want to learn her pers perspective on whether uh, we can solve it by uh, making further technological progress on this technology and make it more accessible to other parts of the world. I'd love to get Sir David in on this. If, if, if Sir David, are you able to unmute yourself on your mic um, so that you, you may have this sort of uh, nearly the end of the show at this point, but may, maybe address this final point. As we wait for that, um, I really want to get in, stuck into some of your tweet responses. Thank you for being so engaging on this. We really appreciate your contribution. Contributions like Moinul Rakib, who says this could be catastrophic. As you already saw, how your seeding turned South Asia dry. Pakistan and India got heavy rainfall and Bangladesh didn't. Stop selfishness, Moinul says. The earth is for all, not for the wealthy people only. Tariq Zuinat um, says, thank you all for this conversation. I think we have to work to focus on decreasing greenhouse gases, as our speakers have mentioned. Stop deforestation, stop desertification and increase the, uh, the dependence on renewable energy. Nawaz Ali uh, Lahore says, agreed with Sir David, yes, we should try all means. So it seems that the technical issues persist, although we've had a robust, important, insightful debate so far. Uh, thank you so much for both of my guests. At this point, I do want to uh, do what we do at the end of the show every every time, uh, Jenny, if I might, I want to come to you for one specific thing. We try our best in these shows to see if there has been a moment of learning, a moment of growth, or even a moment of pause um, for our speakers as the conversation has progressed. Jenny, 
Has there been anything that Sir David has said or indeed anyone else that has made you think slightly differently or, or been a reason for you to pause and um, reflect on what's been said? I'd love to, to hear your thoughts on that. Sure, yes. Um, I, I, I guess I wasn't aware of the analogy with biomimicry with cloud brightening, that somehow it's, um, you know, enhancing what happens naturally. Um, so that was a different uh, angle than what I'd understood before. So that was interesting. Thank you. No, my absolute pleasure. I'd love to get in more from Sir David King, but unfortunately, it seems that the technical issues do persist. Um, uh, oh, there I you think, are, Sir David. Uh, yeah, I'm, fi I'm finally back. Something happened there. <laughs> um, so, so, so what I do want to say is I don't think there's a, a very big chasm between uh, Jenny and myself, but I do think Indeed. my mm -hmm. challenge would be how do we manage to create a manageable future for humanity from where we are today? I wish to hell we weren't where we are today, but unfortunately we are. And I'm afraid I cannot see a way forward if we don't, A, reduce emissions deeply and rapidly, and it's got to be the wealthy world that takes the lead. And then, B, remove excess greenhouse gases from the atmosphere at scale. I haven't had a chance to talk about what we're working on there, but there are enormous opportunities mm. at close to zero cost. And at the same time, three, in order to achieve those first two objectives, we need more time and we simply haven't got it unless we can learn how to deal with the tipping points that have gone in the Arctic Circle region. And I simply ask anybody who accepts those three challenges how would you go about uh, mm. re refreezing the Arctic Circle region or managing the problem? If I could just refer to a member of the uh, Sami people who is on the Climate Crisis Advisory Group, Tero Mustanen. I spoke to Tero in April last year. We were just chatting. He's up there on the permafrost region in northern Finland. What's the temperature, I said? He said, it's really cold. It's minus 30. I spoke to him at the end of July last year when the polar sun had returned to the North Pole region. He said, you're not going to believe it. It's plus 30. And this year he experienced plus 32 on the permafrost. And what he said was the arboreal forest is now experiencing lightning for the first time any of the Sami or Inuit people have seen it, and the arboreal forests are burning. So what, what we're looking at is already a situation where we are destroying the actual ecosystems that the Sami and Inuit people need to survive on. So David, Jenny, Alperin, Miriam, thank you so much for being part of this critical conversation during the week the two weeks of COP27. We are Doha Debates. This is Doha Debates on Twitter Spaces. We have been grateful for your time. We hope you've enjoyed this. And if you want to listen to any other of our conversations, please go on to DohaDebates.com where you can find a raft and a wealth uh, of our shows. I've been Nella for Hedayat. Thank you for listening.